Chapter Six of the Air Lords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six: An Unequal Duel. But to return to my narrative and my swooper, from which I was gazing at the interior of the Han ship. This ship was not unlike the great dirigibles of the twentieth century in shape, except that it had no suspended control car nor gondolas, no propellers and no rudders, aside from a permanently fixed double fishtail stabilizer at the rear, and a number of keels so arranged as to make the most of the repeller ray airlift columns. Its width was probably twice as great as its depth, and its length about twice its width. That is to say, it was about a hundred feet from the main keel to the top deck at their maximum distance from each other, about two hundred feet wide amidship, and between four hundred and five hundred feet long. It had, in addition to the top deck, three interior decks. In its general curvature, the ship was a compromise between a true streamlined design and a flattened cylinder. For a distance of probably seventy-five to one hundred feet, back of the nose there were no decks except that formed by the bottom of the hull, but from this point back the decks ran to within a few feet of the stern. At various spots on the hull curvature in this great hollow nose were platforms from which the crews of the disray generators and the electronoscope and electronophone devices manipulated their apparatus. Into this space from the forward end of the center deck projected the control room. The walls, ceiling, and floor of this compartment were simply the surfaces of viewplates. There were no windows or other openings. The operations officers within the control room, as far as their vision was concerned, might have imagined themselves suspended in space, except for the transmitters, levers, and other signaling devices around them. Five officers, I understand, had their posts in the control room. The captain and the chiefs of scopes, phones, disrays, and navigation. Each of these was in continuous interphone communication with his subordinates in other posts throughout the ship. Each viewplate had its phone connected with its eye machines on the hull, the crews of which would switch from telescopic to normal view at command. There were, of course, many other viewplates at executive posts throughout the ship. The Hans followed a peculiar system in the command of their ships. Each ship had a double complement of officers, active officers and base officers. The former were in actual active charge of the ship and its apparatus. The latter remained at the ship base, at desks equipped with viewplates and phones, in constant communication with their correspondents on the ship. They acted continuously as consultants, observers, recorders, and advisors during the flight or action. Although not primarily accountable for the operation of the ship, they were senior to, and in a sense responsible for the training and efficiency of the active officers. The ionomagnetic coils, which served as the casings, plates, and insulators of the gigantic condensers, were all located amidship on a center line reaching clear through from the top to the bottom of the hull, and reaching from the forward to the rear repray generators that is, from points about 110 feet, from bow and stern. The crew's quarters were arranged on both sides of the coils. To the outside of these, where the several decks touched the hull, were located the various pieces of phone, scope, and disray apparatus. The ship into which I was gazing, with my ultrascope, at a telescopic and penetrative setting, carried a crew of perhaps 150 men all told and except for the strained looks on their evil yellow faces, I might have been tempted to believe I was looking on some 25th century pleasure excursion, for there was no running around, nor appearance of activity. The Hans loved their ease, and despite the fact that this was a warship, every machine and apparatus in it was equipped with a complement of seats and specially designed couches, in which officers and men reclined as they gazed at their viewplates and manipulated the little sets of controls placed convenient to their hands. The picture was a comic one to me, and I laughed, wondering how such soft creatures had held the sturdy and virile American race in complete subjection for centuries. But my laugh died as my mind grasped at the obvious explanation. These Hans were only soft physically. Mentally, they were hard, efficient, ruthless, and consciousless. Impulsively, 
I nosed my swooper down toward the ship and shot toward it at full rocket power. I had acted so swiftly that I had covered nearly half the distance toward the ship before my mind slowly drifted out of the daze of my emotion. This proved my undoing. Their scope men saw me too quickly, for in heading directly at them I became easily visible, appearing as a steady expanding point. Looking through their hull, I saw the crew of a disray generator come suddenly to attention. A second later their beam engulfed me. For an instant my heart stood still. But the inertron shell of my swooper was impervious to the disintegrator ray. I was out of luck, however, so far as my control over my tiny ship was concerned. I had been hurtling in a direct line toward the ship when the beam found me. Now when I tried to swerve out of the beam, the swooper responded but sluggishly to the shift I made in the rocket angle. I was, of course, traveling straight down a beam of vacuum. As my craft slowly nosed to the edge of the beam, the air rushing into this vacuum from all sides threw it back in again. Had I shot my ship across one of these beams at right angles, my momentum would have carried me through with no difficulty. But I had no momentum now except in the line of the beam, and this being a vacuum now, my momentum under full rocket power was vastly increased. This realization gave me a second and more acute thrill. Would I be able to check my little craft in time, or would I, helpless as a bullet itself, crash through the shell of the Han ship to my own destruction? I shut off my rocket motor, but noticed no practical diminution of speed. It was the fear of the Hans themselves that saved me. Through my ultrascope I saw sudden alarm on their faces, hesitation, a frantic officer in the control room jabbering into his phone. Then shakily the crew flipped their beam off to the side. The jar on my craft was terrific. Its nose caught the rushing tumble of air first, of course, and my tail, sailing in a vacuum, swung around with a sickening wrench. My swooper might as well have been a barrel in the tumult of waters at the foot of Niagara. What was worse, the Hans kept me in that condition. Three of their beams were now playing in my direction, but not directly on me except for split seconds. Their technique was to play their beams around me more than on me, jerking them this way and that, so as to form vacuum pockets into which the air slapped and roared as the beam shifted, tossing me around like a chip. Desperately I tried to bring my craft under control, to point its nose toward the Han ship and discharge an explosive rocket. Bitterly I cursed my self-confidence and my impulsive action. An experienced pilot of the present age would have known better than to be caught shooting straight down a disray beam. He would have kept his ship shooting constantly at some angle to it, so that his momentum would carry him across it if he hit it. Too late I realized that there was more to the business of air fighting than instinctive skill in guiding a swooper. At last, when for a fraction of a second my nose pointed toward the Hans, I pressed the button of my rocket gun. I registered a hit, but not an accurate one. My projectile grazed an upper section of the ship's hull. At that it did terrific damage. The explosion battered in a section about fifty feet in diameter, partially destroying the top deck. At the same instant I had shot my rocket. I had, in a desperate attempt to escape that turmoil of tumbling air, released a catch and dropped all that was possible to drop of my Ultron ballast. My swooper shot upward like a bubble streaking to the surface of water. I was free of the trap in which I had been caught, but unable to take advantage of the confusion which reigned on the Han ship. I was as helpless to maneuver my ship now in its uprush as when I had been tumbling in the air pockets. Moreover, I was badly battered from plunging around in my shell like a pellet in a box and partially unconscious. I was miles in the air when I recovered myself. The swooper was steady enough now, but still rising, my instruments told me, and traveling in a general westward direction at full speed. Far below me was a sea of clouds, stretching from horizon to horizon, and through occasional breaks in its surface I could see still other seas of clouds at lower levels. End of chapter 6